speaker, Michael Moore says about her book, Main Street Vegan, isn't just preaching to the choir, but to the people in the pews and the ones who can't fit into the pews. <laughs> <laughs> Veg News calls Victoria's book the Vegan Bible New Testament. And President Bill Clinton writes, I'm delighted that you're helping to make the vegan lifestyle more accessible and achievable for as many people as possible. Victoria hosts the weekly Main Street Vegan radio show podcast on unity.fm. And she is the founder and director of Main Street Vegan Academy an exciting live program on site in New York City that trains and certifies vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And the ones that she trains are from around the world. I am honored and excited. Would you please welcome Victoria Moran. And thank you, Lynn. It's so wonderful to meet people that I know from online and, and from the phone and from their wonderful work and finally get to have a face to go with the name. Thank you all for being here, because you could be in that room eating. <laughs> no. This is wonderful. So I just want to do a little quick survey to see who's here. And I want to be very clear that this is not to find out who's cool. You are cool by virtue of being here. But just so that I speak to who's actually here and not who I might guess is here, I want to know who is just vegan as all get out. You're vegan, you can always be vegan, you're totally I mean, 100% okay. vegan. All right. Who is really interested? Maybe you're vegetarian, you're, you're looking at vegan, or you're, you're strongly veg curious. Okay. Uh, how about uh, you're an omnivore and you're happy with that? You're health conscious, interested in learning more about your health. Okay. And then you just eat everything in sight that's, that's not healthy. Okay, that's very good. You, because you're honest, get a copy of my book, Creating a Charmed Life. <laughs> How do you know to only bring one book? And I said, because I've never had more than one person raise their hand. <laughs> so good. So we're all here in this together, on this lovely planet together. It, it's a real pleasure for me to be back in Portland. I realized when I woke up yesterday morning exactly where I was. You know, when you fly across the country and you kind of jet lagged and weird, it's like, where am I? But when I opened my shades yesterday morning, I remembered something that happened the last time I was in Portland. I just got to tell you guys. I was here on a book tour with a book that nobody bought because it, it had a really ugly title. In my defense, I will say it was the publisher's title, not mine. But it was called Fat, Broke, and Lonely No More. Did you all read that? Uh, my mom read it. She said it was really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was here for that book tour, and I've been on the road for a while, and I had kind of chipped nail polish, so I'm kind of walking around looking for a nail salon, and your downtown area is just so beautiful, and it was so uplifting and inspiring, and I loved it, but I wasn't seeing any nail places. So I'm making these kind of concentric circles, and then I get to the outer edge of downtown where it's not so nice, and I was a little bit kind of just safe. And I saw this little, very dingy kind of nail place. Dingy. Nobody was in there, but one guy who was supposedly working, except he wasn't really working, he was building a model airplane, <laughs> which I learned is what you can do with the glue from the sculptured nails. But anyway, so he's doing my nails, and he's not really very friendly or talkative, kind of shy person. 
But finally, I asked him the question that he wanted to answer. I said, this is wonderful music that you're playing. What is this? And you know sometimes, and this is important for our vegan outreach as well, sometimes when you just ask the right question, you just meet somebody where they live, you come to somebody at a place that they're excited. I always say to my radio guests, OK, we'll talk about the book you wrote five years ago, but how about what you're passionate about right now? And this guy was passionate about that music. And he just lit up and he said, you have come to a dancing city. Did y'all know this is a dancing city? He said, you have come to a dancing city. We do all kinds of dance here in Portland. And he explained to me that when you learn how to dance, you can finally hear the music. And when you learn how to dance, you move with another person. And then you don't have to get your way all the time, because you just move the way that they move. And everything starts to work. And then he got really serious. Now, this is 2007, remember. And he said, ma'am, and I said, yes. He said, ma'am, we would not be at war in Iraq if President Bush knew how to dance. <laughs> and then, then there's more. My nails are kind of wet, and he comes around to lead me over to these nail dryers. We never make it there. Instead, we stop in this kind of open area in the middle of the nail salon. And he comes and stands right in front of me and says, first, we learn rumba. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, we do, <laughs> knowing that I'm equipped with two left feet. But I figured that would seem kind of easy. And we did it, and it was fun. And then, then, he changes the CDs. How much life has changed since 2007? <laughs> different president, different way to hear music. But he changed the CD. And he came back and he said, you're pretty good. I would ordinarily never do tango in the first lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but since you're only here for 24 hours, and you know, sometimes that's how I like to look at life. We're only here for 24 hours at a time. And so he did this thing, and he put his hand here, and he put my hand here, and all of a sudden, I was Madonna. <laughs> and he was a good looking guy that was with her at Avia. And we did these moves that I thought were just extraordinary and fabulous and amazing. And probably if anybody looked in the window, they would say, what are those people doing in that nail salon? <laughs> but it was magical. And so I have magical memories of Portland. And when I come here and I see what you guys have going on in the veg world, you have the world famous vegan mall. Nobody has that. Nobody has that. And I also have been places, you know, speaking for people and like, oh, it's so cool to be vegan and you know everybody ought to be vegan. And sometimes people will say something to me like, yeah, well, I don't live in a place like Portland. <laughs> <laughs> so you are famous round and about for all this great vegetative goings on. So what I'm here to talk with you about today is making it work to be vegan in this world, the real world, Portland and other places. And it's still different. It's so much more widespread. It's so much better known. I was interested when Lynn was reading the introduction, and I should have that Bill Clinton letter memorized by now, because I kind of rub it, you know, like a Lennon's lamp. But he said vegan, and he used the word. Just a little survey. Who likes the word? Who thinks it's a great word and we ought to keep using it? Finally. <laughs> OK, and who thinks we need a, a less, I don't know, a less vegan word. <laughs> OK, this is very interesting. That should be maybe suggested as a panel for next year, the, the vegan versus other word debate. I am way for vegan, and, and I'll tell you why. First, people finally know what it is. Now, I've been vegetarian since, oh my god, I'm going to sound so old. 1969 and vegan since 1983. And I gotta tell you, when you said vegan then, people said, huh? Yeah. And, and they would talk about a planet that maybe Spock came from. <laughs> you don't get that anymore. 
You also don't get these bizarre mispronunciations. I have not been called a vegan or a vegan for a really, really long time. The word is used in the medical literature. And we're always saying, well, this study said this great thing, and this study said that. Do you know what they called the group of people who were eating foods from the plant kingdom? Those were the people on the vegan diet because it says what it means. It means no animal products, and that's what it means. Now, is it good to be plant-based? And yeah, it's fabulous and wonderful. And if more and more people became more and more plant-based, that means that when you and I go to airports and truck stops, there'll be all kinds of food for us. <laughs> Plus, the world will get a whole lot better for the animals and for the planet. So nothing wrong with that at all. But I'm very proud to be vegan. And I know what it means, and I know that most people that I talk to will know what it means too. So that's why I would like to use it as an acronym for my talk this afternoon, because I know that people remember things when it's a letter of a word, and then they remember the idea. So I'm going to talk today about vegan, and I'll tell you in advance what I'm going to say, and then I'll say it. V is for validate your choices. E is for embody a healthy lifestyle. G, get to know other vegans. A, add more to your life than you subtract. And N, never forget the animals. And I think as we discuss these topics, those of you who are vegan, those of you who are veg curious, are going to find where you fit in this and something that you can take home. So validate your choices. That means learn some stuff, which is why you're in this room and in this building and, and having a wonderful time here today. Have you learned something already? New vegans and old vegans? Now, isn't it cool that those of us who have been doing this for a really long time can learn things on a day like this? Because there's always something new. Now, is it fair that we have to know all this stuff? Other people don't have to know all kinds of things. Somebody that's feeding their kids Cracker Jack and Coca-Cola <laughs> does not have to tell you where the kid gets the protein. But you know, when you're feeding your child kale and quinoa, you've got to explain that to people. You know what? <laughs> that is the plight of the minority. And we happen to be a voluntary minority. Now, I happen to believe that what we're doing here and now is going to change the future. I think of vegans and animal rights people right now today as where people who were slavery abolitionists were in about 1800. There was history, long history, but nothing seemed to be changing. They didn't know that in 60 or so years in the future, all the work that they had done and that the people had done before them was going to finally come to fruition. I think that's where we are. And it's really exciting. And sometimes I think, but I want to see it. I want to see this vegan world. And then I think about those guys that painted the, the ceilings and the chapels, or, and the people that built those wonderful cathedrals in Europe in the olden days. And how have you heard that they say somebody would start working on one of those cathedrals, and then his sons would work on the cathedral, and maybe his grandsons would see it finished. Well, that's kind of what's happening with us. So we just need to have a fabulous time while we are where we are doing all this stuff. And we need to learn things so that we can bring people around and be educators. When I train my people in New York City, my vegan lifestyle coaches and educators, that's what we're about. But we're all educators. Is the uh, sign-up sheet going around, by the way? OK, great. So that's just, uh, I don't blanket people with a lot of email, but every now and then, about every six weeks, I send out something short and helpful. If you don't like it, there's a very easy unsubscribe. And if you think, gosh, I might want to be a vegan lifestyle coach and educator, well, just do a check mark and we'll send you some information about that. But now, we're going to be validating our choices, and let's talk about some of the things that we're going to need to know. 
Well, that protein question, it just comes up all the time. <laughs> and instead of rolling our eyes and thinking, why can't you come up with a more interesting question, here's the way to answer that question, in my opinion. And that is to say, you know, that is a terrific question. I used to worry about that all the time. Because you know what? Think back. Didn't you worry about it when you first heard about vegetarianism and, and veganism? Of course, everybody worried about it because we've been trained to worry about it. That's what we've been told we're going to be missing out on. So people do not want a huge lecture. They want a sound bite. So answering vegan questions is very good training for when you go on TV and when Oprah asks you the question. So you say, that is a really good question. I used to worry about that myself until I learned that protein is in every natural food. And the only way that you can be deficient in protein in the modern Western world is if you became anorexic, if you just didn't get enough calories, if you were a severe alcoholic who drank all your calories, or if you were such an extreme fruitarian that all you ever ate was fruit, you never had any vegetables, you never had any nuts or seeds, in those instances, yes, you could become deficient in protein. How likely is that? And chances are they'll say, oh gosh, never knew that. Now every now and then you might have somebody who presses you a little bit more. They're going to say, yeah, but what about the amino acids that make up the protein? You're going to miss one of those. Well, actually, what a great question. <laughs> These amino acids are spread throughout the plant kingdom. And so whenever you eat foods that are high in some and low in others, you're going to eat other foods during the day that have the other amino acids. Remember that old book from the 1970s that said we had to do all this mixing of grains and beans to get the right kind of protein? The author has come out and said that she was wrong. Now, I write books, and we authors love our words. To say that we are wrong is a great big deal. And she didn't just say she was wrong about something on page 234. She said her whole premise, the thing that made her famous, was wrong. Let's listen to the woman. And you can also say, you know, there is one amino acid that some people could have been a little bit short on back in the hippie days of eating just mostly brown rice and vegetables, and that's the amino acid lysine. And you know what is just full of lysine is beans. So if you eat some beans or some lentils or some split peas or some tofu, sometime during the day, you're going to be covered. And if someday you just say, I can't stand another bean, have some pistachio nuts or some peanuts or some peanut butter, which the dietitian Jenny Messina calls honorary beans because they're high in lysine. Now what about calcium? That's a question that we get sometimes. And what we say is, oh my gosh, did that worry me too? Being a woman and having a little small frame, meaning that I don't have much bone mass to lose. So I looked into this, and what I found is that I can get my calcium the same place that the cow gets hers. What is calcium? It's a mineral. And where do minerals live? In the dirt. Well, how can we get them? Out of the dirt. Well, the green plants translate the minerals into a usable form so that a cow or you or I can get the minerals that we need. So you want to eat lots and lots of leafy greens. And calcium naturally occurs in other plant foods. It's in oranges, it's in sesame seeds, it's in almonds. And if you drink the commercial milks, this is another thing that is just so cool about 2013. I remember when if you wanted the soy milk, you had to send a check to a guy in Ohio. <laughs> and he would send you a bag of white powder. It was a little bit like a drug deal. But yeah, if it had been cocaine, it would have been like $5 million. He sent you a big old white bag of this powder that we all just trusted with soy milk and, and not talcum or, or something terrible. It, it worked fine. 
But then, of course, you had to buy a blender. Ooh, who has one of those? So, remembering that, and now going to my regular supermarket. I'm not talking about the Whole Foods or the Trader Joe's or the Mrs. Gooch. This is just fine, fair foods in Harlem, where I live. And we can choose from soy milk, almond milk, rice milk, coconut milk, sunflower milk, oat milk, flax milk, good heavens! And guess what? Every single one of those milks is fortified with as much calcium as cow's milk, or even 50% more. I don't know that we need the 50% more, but it's there. So, can you not worry now? You know, some people will still worry. Because whenever we're fed this bill of goods, like there's something magical about the milk that comes out of the cow. Well, yes it is, if you're a calf. <laughs> this is the substance that is going to grow you from a little baby calf to a thousand pound, very large creature in a relatively small amount of time. That's magical. Do I want that? No. So learn about the basics of vegan nutrition. You do not have to be Wikipedia walking. You just need to know the basics. And you know what? You're going to learn things, and then you'll know more. I want to invite those of you who are new or those of you who are thinking of, of making this leap to just be happy about it and be ease-filled with it. Because you don't have to know everything today. All you have to do today is Eat plant foods from morning until nighttime, and then you go to bed, and then it's renewable. Is this recognizable to anybody? You got any friends of Bill and the audience? You heard about one day at a time. This is how people sober up. This is how people can vegan up too. You don't have to worry about oh gosh, you know, in in uh, February of 2015, I'm going to take that cruise. You don't have to worry, because that's not now. But what about when I go to my sister's wedding next year? It's, she might break up with him between now and then. <laughs> All you have to worry about is today, a day at a time. And you know, you're going to change. Back before I was vegan, I did compulsive overeating. I was a binge eater. And I was always gaining weight, losing weight, dieting. It was just a terrible, terrible way to live. But every once in a while, I'd go through a period where it was better, where some kind of grace entered me, and I was able to have some time when I wasn't really hurting myself with food. And I wanted to eat in a way that made me feel good about myself. And I remembered that near where I worked in Kansas City, Missouri, where I lived at that time, there was a tea room at Macy's. And I would sometimes go to Macy's tea room, and I would have for lunch a slice of quiche and a glass of white wine. Now, I look back at that, and I think, do you know what you were having for lunch? You were having cholesterol, a saturated fat, a crust with lard in it, white flour, and alcohol. <laughs> that sounds really yummy and nutritious, but you know what? At the time, it made me feel like I was making the best choice I knew. Because at the time, that was the best choice that I knew. And it helped me. So know what you know today about being vegan. Make the very best choices that you know how to make. And if you learn something tomorrow that's going to give you the opportunity to make better choices, good. It doesn't mean that what you did today was wrong. You cannot screw this up. See, I don't know what your worldview is, and so if, if I use a word that you don't care for, just translate it into something you do like. But in my humble opinion, we're doing God's work here, and there is just no way to screw that up. So you wake up in the morning, whoa, this is going to be cool. I'm going to eat all this fabulous vegan food today. Lucky me. And you go to bed at night, and you say, well, that was pretty cool. Pretty darn cool. And before long, you'll start seeing benefits. We're going to talk about those in a minute as we discuss E in the word vegan. And that means embody healthy choices. Now, why this is important, particularly for people who say, I don't care about all that health stuff. I'm doing this for the animals, period. 
if you are doing this for the animals, period, you need to pay more attention to the health stuff than people who are doing it for health, for several reasons. One is, if you're with a group of people and you are, say, Bill Clinton or somebody else who's doing this for his health, you say, I'm doing this for my health. Everybody's like, okay, because you're doing it for your health, it must be a healthy thing to do. But if you say, I'm doing this because I love animals, you know what they're going to say? Where do you get your protein? Where do you get your calcium? I knew somebody who did that, and she didn't look very good. So we all need to embody a healthy lifestyle. So this takes more than food. Now, I know some people disagree with me on that. If you all heard Dr. McDougall earlier today, isn't he wonderful? I heard him yesterday, and I don't know if he said this today, but yesterday he said, when they use that phrase, diet and lifestyle, that's a distraction. Did he say this this morning? He said yesterday, that's a distraction. It is not diet and lifestyle, it's the food. Okay, but you know what? We were talking about calcium a while ago. If you just went to bed, and all you did was use your clicker and watch TV all the time, and you ate a perfect diet, your bones would not do very well. It does take more than the food, but I get it, I get it. We're basically dying because of the food. But let's take good care of ourselves in as many ways as we can figure out to take care of ourselves. So that means that even if you do have three Dr. Phil's taped and he's got people in the Dr. Phil house and it's very, very, very interesting, you shut it off and go to bed on time. You also want to have dinner a little bit earlier so that it's digested before you go to bed and then your body can deal with, with the detox part of, of your life. And you know what happens then? You start to look real pretty. You know how some of these people, some of these more raw type people, maybe certain vegans, they have this glow. And you just think, what do they do? Well, they don't do a darn thing any one of us can't do. It's just we have to want to. Now, the way that we want to is that we develop a quality that I was reminded about not long ago from a long time vegan. Who knows who Dick Gregory is? Okay, yeah. people of my generation. Well, I'll tell the others. Dick Gregory was a really famous comedian in the 1960s, very obese. One day, he wandered into a little health food store on the south side of Chicago, met a naturopathic doctor named Alvinia Fulton. She turned him into a high raw vegan. He just trimmed down and slimmed down, did all kinds of juicing. Big, important person in, in the civil rights movement, also uh, in opposition to the Vietnam War. He fasted on juice for about two years. Dr. Fulton put enough powders in there and all that he did fine. Anyway. I was reminded by a friend of mine that way, way back in the old days, back in Kansas City, we went to a lecture by Dick Gregory, and he was at the height of his powers, and he was as famous as he was ever going to be. And after the talk, this woman went up to him, and as my friend was reminding me last week of, of this uh, event, she said, that was the most beautiful woman that up to then I had ever seen in my life. And she was like cozying up to him and kind of rubbing up against him. And then she whispered something in his ear. And he still had his microphone on, like I have on right now. <laughs> and he said to her, Sister, respect yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remembered it. It was there in my memory bank, but I hadn't thought about it for a long time. And when I heard that, I thought, that is so important. For any of us who wants to make a change, when I was raising my daughter, who is a lifelong vegan, by the way, and she works as a stunt performer, which is pretty cool, but in those days when you were raising children, everybody said, you want to give them a lot of self-esteem. But what I see is it's not about self-esteem. We can think we're incredibly cool, but that doesn't mean that we're going to do what we need to do. That takes self-respect. So you want to have enough self-respect that even though all kinds of fabulous vegan junk food exists, and it's wonderful, thank God for vegan junk food. Because when somebody says, 
Well, I, I can see why it would be good to be vegan, but you know, I can't give up pizza. You can say, you don't have to. Well, you know, the vegan thing, that is cool. But you know what? I mean, donuts are just really my thing. You can have them. So it's great that we have them. But on the other hand, if they start to make up more of the diet than these whole foods that grow up out of the ground, we're talking the vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds. If we start to eat too much of the packaged stuff, you know how we start to look? Kind of packaged. <laughs> and kind of cellophane, you know what I mean? And that means that we're not separated from people who are eating regular American diets. And it would be wonderful to say, but the ethics of the thing, I mean, once people understand about the animals, they'll make a change. And what about the planet? The planet is going under. But a lot of people just don't care about the animals. And a lot of people don't get it about the planet because it's too big. But they get it if you used to look cellophane, and now you look rosy glow. So you want to eat really good food, and you want to take really good care of yourself, and you want to have a delightful attitude. You know, sometimes those of us who know about stuff going on in the world, not just what goes on with other people, but what the animals go through, oh, we should just be miserable all the time. But we can't afford that because we've got to have the energy that comes from being happy. That's part of the body and a healthy lifestyle. G in the word vegan, get to know other vegans. Most of us aren't even nuts. Um, <laughs> I mean, some of us are a bit eccentric, but that makes life interesting. The thing of it is, it's very hard to do anything without support. If you don't know another vegan, if your family's not vegan, if you don't work with any vegans, you just start to feel like you're this island. And you're always answering questions. And you're always justifying what's in your lunch. When if you get involved with a group like Northwest Veg, if you make friends who are doing this, then it becomes this incredibly wonderful thing. Last night, I went to dinner at Blossoming Lotus with some people from the organization. And it was just so, yeah, right, we're going out. Doesn't everybody go out and eat vegan food on Friday night? That's just what you do. And when you start to see that that's what you do, then it doesn't matter that other people are asking you questions because you're doing what's normal. In fact, you're recreating normal. But I suggest that you not just get to know other vegans socially and online, but that you get to know our work and our message. And when I say our, I'm talking about most of us, because we're all doing something. I mean, some of us write books, and some of us are blogging, and some of us are YouTubing. It's amazing how much information we can get in just to keep ourselves inspired. On the plane, I downloaded several documentaries, and it happened that the two that I watched were about fashion. I watched one about models and one about Bergdorf's. So this morning, when I had a little extra time, it occurred to me, you haven't shopped for clothes in a really long time, and they're looking pretty ratty, go to Macy's. Now, I live in New York City. We have a Macy's. We have one on 34th Street where a miracle happened. <laughs> but it hadn't occurred to me that I needed to go look for some clothes until I watched those two documentaries. So that's what we need to be doing with the vegan thing. Just keep it front and center, keep it top of mind, and documentaries are fabulous. Who has seen Force Over Nuts? Little, okay. Whoa! <coughs> and you know they're doing a new movie? Who knows about that? I'll tell you, this new movie is called Game Changers. It won't be out for a year, but it's about these really big macho guys who are changing the game on what it means to be a real man. So these are big macho vegan athletes. In fact, a week ago today, my husband and I took several trains into the wilds of Queens to a biker bar called um, Cheap Shots to see some of the filming. They were filming a guy named Rob Bigwood, 
who is a nationally ranked vegan arm wrestler. Who has seen a arm wrestling competition live? Wow, more than I would have thought. To my <laughs> we were talking on the way home that you think when you become a vegan that you're going to go to like the Mother Earth Eco Festival, but the idea that you go to a biker bar in Queens with $5 pitchers of beer, I mean, it's just really a great cultural experience. But we're all doing stuff. So let's see, who has seen Vegetate? <coughs> that, that's another sweet one. You can see that on, on Netflix. That's about three people that the filmmaker found on Craigslist, and she got them to be vegan for 90 days. Uh, there's another one called Chow Down. Has anybody seen that? A little hard to find. It's good, isn't it? Excellent. Uh, and then uh, the fasting one, uh, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. Really, really great film. So you inspire yourself. You put this stuff in your mind, and then some of that other stuff, it's kind of balanced out. When I was pregnant with my daughter, and I read all the books on how to be the world's best mom, did you all do that, parents? <laughs> but then I found it was confusing me. Because one person would say, you know, bring the baby to bed. One person would say, let her cry it out. Another one would say, feed on a schedule. Another would say, you know, feed on a man. It's like, what do I do? And finally, I realized that my heart was in alignment with the bring the baby to bed, feed on demand. I found out that was called attachment parenting. Anybody familiar with that? I think out here in Portland, probably a lot of you are. That it just makes sense when a little creature is just fresh from heaven, that you just hold them close and, and just give them the benefit of the doubt. But I found that for that to work, I couldn't read the other stuff. It was too confusing. So I would just suggest that when you see an article maybe in a women's magazine about the great new weight loss diet where, I don't know, you eat raw fish or something, just kind of turn the page, you know? Look, look, at, look at the article about, I don't know, Angelina Jolie instead. Um, so you want to get to know other vegans and get to know what we're thinking. And then you kind of bring us with you when you go to Thanksgiving dinner and other people have to so be there, people we love. Okay. This is great. I have a chapter in, in Main Street Vegan, which is 40 little chapters with a recipe at the end of each one. And one of my chapters is called, Love the People Who Just Wish You'd Eat Some Meat. So, <laughs> so now we're to the letter A in the word vegan, and this is my favorite. This is add more to your life than you subtract. So what are we going to add? All kinds of great stuff. You're going to add foods you've never had before. You're going to add experiences and people and adventures. You're going to add fashions if you're into that. You're going to add all sorts of interesting exploration of alternative health. There's just so much that you can add to your life. Here's what happens sometimes. You'll be vegan, and somebody will say, well, what, what is, I don't get it. What is this vegan thing that you do? And sometimes we'll think, live one, a potential convert. I'm going to get that. And so we say, well, when you're a vegan, you don't eat any meat, chicken, fish, dairy products, including cheese, eggs, including baked goods, butter, probably honey, and if you're an ethical vegan, you don't wear fur, leather, wool, <laughs> silk, cosmetics or household products tested on animals. You lost him back at butter. <laughs> He's waiting for the vow of celibacy. <laughs> the question about what was this vegan thing? He say, oh my gosh, I cannot even tell you that next to having my kids, this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. I thought it was just something that I was doing because I really love animals or because my cholesterol was high or whatever your reason was. But once I did it, I realized that a whole new world opens up. The food is fabulous. The people are fascinating. I feel amazing. My doctor says he wishes he could get all his patients to do this. I don't know. 
That's all I can tell you, but I can have you over for dinner. <laughs> so you want to add into your life all sorts of great, wonderful, amazing things. A couple of weeks ago, I took my little dog, Forbes, down to Chinatown, Forbes the Prosperity Dog, um, <laughs> to Chinatown in New York City for a writer's retreat. I'm working on my next book, which is going to be called Ageless Vegan. You like it? Mm, yeah. So anyway, I'm down in Chinatown, which I love, because they have all this produce that I never see anyplace else. Now, some of it I recognize, like durians. Who's had a durian? It is this amazing fruit from, I think it's Indonesia, and it tastes like cheesecake, but it has a very strong smell that some people equate with dirty socks. Now, I don't think it smells that bad myself, and it's really, really yummy. But there's just all this interesting produce. So learn about interesting produce. The world is just full of varieties of even simple foods like corn and potatoes. We just don't get most of them. I know you have great farmer's markets out here, and you can learn about all this stuff. Try it all. You can have whole dinners that are colorful. You can have a dinner where all the food is purple. I mean, just, it's fun. Meat eaters can't do that, because meat doesn't come in purple unless it's really, really off. <laughs> you want to add wonderful cuisines of the world. My taxi driver today told me he was from Ethiopia, and I said, well, I need to thank you then, because it is your country that introduced me to dark leafy greens. Now, we talk about kale these days. You know, there are the t-shirts that say kale and the same typeface as the ones that say Yale. And then there's <laughs> real men eat kale, and only kale can save us now. So yes, I get it. Kale is the world's sexiest vegetable. But I was a vegan for years before I ever ate anything that green. And then I discovered a dish called gomen at an Ethiopian restaurant in Los Angeles. <coughs> And I learned that dark leafy greens can be so delicious. So I figured out how to fix them, and I've been fixing them ever since. So expand your horizons and add some of the stuff. So what do you eat? So often people say, well, what do I eat? Well, you just eat. You know, sometimes you can eat what you ate before, but just stick in something vegan. And that's for the very beginning. That's kind of the easiest thing to do. It's sort of like, if you were going to have you know, hummus and, and veggies and pita bread, well, you just had it over again. <laughs> but if you were going to have, say, a hamburger, you're going to have a veggie burger, you can just do these easy substitutions. But over time, as you want to expand and get healthier, you want to think about having like great big salads, like big salads. I get my salad bowls at the restaurant supply house. And I never just have a salad that's like just cold. I toss in steamed broccoli and yams, and then it becomes like a meal. Oh, it's so, so good. Juices, we're going to be talking about that tomorrow morning. I'm speaking at 11 on how to really make your vegan lifestyle something that's going to make you all bright and sparkly and youthful forever and all that. So you start to bring in all these wonderful colors. I tell the people that I work with as a vegan lifestyle coach, you want your plate to look like a Christmas tree, mostly green, with splashes of other bright colors. Because that's where all those wonderful phytochemicals and antioxidants are hanging out. So add so much to your life, way more than you subtract. And then, N for the word vegan, is to never forget the animals. Now, why is this if you're doing this for your health, which a lot of people are? Or maybe you're doing it for the planet, or maybe you're doing it for some other reason. We used to have people who did it to save money. Now, with all the government subsidies and things, it seems like, you know, it costs a lot to eat in this world, regardless of what you're eating. But whatever your reason for wanting to go veg, the reason that it's important to never forget the animals is that the animals have more invested in your dinner than you do. Because you're going to eat a lot of dinners in your life. Some are going to be sensational. Some are going to be OK. Some are going to be not so hot. But over the course of your life, none of that really matters very much. But if there happens to be somebody on your plate, 
that mattered a lot to them. It's a beautiful phrase that I learned a long, long time ago from the American Vegan Society. Who knows that there's an American Vegan Society? It was founded in 1960. And I always say to people, that was the first season of Mad Men. <laughs> that was a different time, a different era. But this far-thinking couple, this beautiful visionary couple, the late Jay Dinshaw and his very much not late uh, wife, Freya, founded the American Vegan Society. And they printed really all the literature that was available back when I was becoming vegan. And I have always remembered one quotation. It comes from Mahavira, who was a saint in the Jain religion of India. And Mahavira said, to every creature, his own life is very dear. And I thought, well, that just about sums it up. If I don't have to take somebody's life, and sometimes people will say, but you don't take a life for the milk, you don't take a life for the eggs, not directly, but pretty close. If some of you may not know some of this, but for eggs, for example, even the backyard eggs, you know, a lot of people will say, well, I just eat the humane eggs, and certainly that's a step in the right direction. Absolutely, I applaud anybody moving this way. But the problem with eggs is that half of those eggs that are hatched have boys inside, and there's no place for the boys in an egg operation. So there are actually people, most of them are undocumented immigrants because it's a really crummy job, they're called sexers. And their job is, as the eggs, the hatching eggs, come down a conveyor belt, they take the little chick and see what his or her gender is. And if she's a girl, she goes to the egg farm, which is a pretty awful existence in 97 to 99% of the cases. Because 97 to 99% of eggs sold in this country are from factory farms. And we can talk about how much better or not better the other ones are, but we know that most people are eating factory farmed eggs. And the other little chicks, the ones who happen to be boys, are killed. And the two standard industry measures for getting rid of these unwanted baby boys is suffocation and maceration. And that's just what it sounds like. So yeah, so it is, it's a problem. Uh, dairy, same thing. We've got a mother cow and her sweet little calf. They are the most maternal species. Now who's a mom? Who thinks you're of the most maternal species? I mean, that's what I certainly felt like. But this, this mother cow and her calf, Susie Costin from Farm Sanctuary, has said so eloquently that all a cow wants is a family. But a cow in a dairy herd is not going to get one because she has to be pregnant to produce milk at the rate that's needed commercially. And so she's separated from the baby. This is sad stuff. And I wish that it could just be imprinted and that I didn't have to say it. Because sometimes I feel like it's shoot the messenger. <laughs> People are like, don't tell me that. I don't want to know. But the fact is, now you know. You have been informed. And once we know, we have to act on what we know. You know, so many people will say, I only eat humane meat. Well, I'm not sure that there's really humane meat, but I know what they mean. They, they eat meat from an organic farm, from a farm where conditions are better. And this is certainly a, a step in the right direction, as I said. But all the animals end up in the same slaughter plant. I want to read you something from Main Street Vegan. In the end comes the slaughterhouse. I spent a day in one. The screams and the smells will never leave me, but my clearest memory is of one animal, a used up dairy cow who had not come from a factory farm. She knew humans and didn't expect to be murdered by them. When she stopped in her tracks, unwilling to proceed up the ramp to her death, the man who was to stun her with the captive bolt pistol, a mercy when it works, whistled to her. He whistled the way he whistled to his dog when he went home that evening. 
And even though she heard the screams and smelled the blood, she had faith in this person who pretended to be her friend. But she was shot with the bolt, hoisted up by one leg, her throat slit, and her lovely skin sliced off from jawbone to anus, falling into a pile for shoes and boots and belts and bags. Her carcass rushed past the USDA inspector, who had time for a cursory glance before the next one and the next and the next. She was eviscerated and cut into pieces by low-paid workers who spent their days in a refrigerator, ankle deep in blood, because in that tiny Missouri town, bypassed by both the railroad and the interstate, there was no place else to go. When her parts showed up at a store in St. Louis in styrofoam cradles and plastic wrap, the people who bought them knew nothing about this cow. They weren't there when she responded to a whistle and met her death, having just exhibited a very human trait, trust. But I was there, and because I was, it's my obligation to tell you her story. And even though every time I tell her story, I lose people. I lose people who would otherwise be out there at the book signing table afterwards. And I know that's going to happen. But I made a pact with her that day that as long as I have breath, people are going to hear her story. She matters. Her sisters and her brothers matter. The people who are in hospitals getting bypass surgery and to this day being given cheeseburgers as their first post-op meal. That happened to my father 30 years ago. It happened to the father of a friend of mine three weeks ago. This should not be happening. And we're here today to be sure that at some point soon it will end. Thank you so much. Thank you.